Well, here we are, out in the snow. Don't you like the snow? Uh, it's Friday, that's when I'm recording this, and it's snowing, and it's beautiful, and it's quiet. And you know, one of the things I just really love about the snow is how it just seems to calm everything down. And you can go outside, and you can sit there, and it just seems quieter than normal. Even if cars are driving by, it just dampens everything. And so I'm sitting out here right now, and if you listen careful enough, I'm sure you're not going to be able to hear it, but you can almost hear the snowflakes settling down on the snow. I just love the peace and the quiet that comes with snow. I love it. Which takes me to what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about peace. We started last week talking about our need for renewed hope. Uh, which, of course, starts with Jesus, that he's our rally cry. We've, we started in Isaiah chapter 11 last week, and Isaiah painted this awesome picture. And we're going to be right back in Isaiah chapter 11 today, because I think there's more that we can learn from that passage that definitely applies to us today, and that will help us renew our hope in our future and in our present. So I, I think a really important part of that renewing our hope process is, is finding peace, Finding peace. I think there are times in our life when we, when we feel hopeless because we aren't living in peace. There are times when we, need, when we need to have hope in order to find peace. And I think there are times when we need peace to have hope and hope to have peace. The two just really do. They just go hand in hand. And so we've seen this play out in so many different ways. You've probably seen it play out in your life in particular ways. I know that I've seen it play out in mine, and we've seen it play out in our neighborhood, in the community that the church exists in. As we've engaged with our neighbors who are living in tents and, and living on the street, they are stuck in so much pain, and they lack so much peace. They, they exist in brokenness, they exist in chaos, they exist in addiction, and it's hard for, it's hard for our neighbors to see anything else at times. It's hard, it's hard for our neighbors to see any hope when, when all they can see is pain. And in order for them to see hope and to grasp the hope that we're talking about, sometimes they need to be first introduced to the God of peace. We want people to see the God of hope, but maybe sometimes they have to first know and experience the God of peace. Our neighbors that are on the street, man, it's just overwhelming to me sometimes when we realize how every day is a fight for them. Every day is a fight for them to survive. You know, they need to go to the do a doctor appointment or they need to go to a job interview, interview, but they can't because if they leave their stuff, their stuff gets stolen or their stuff gets taken and, and it, it's just constant anxiety and impossible decisions. And then if they do decide to leave and go get food and go to an appointment while they're gone, someone comes and takes their tent and takes all their stuff, and now they're left with nothing, no tent, no sleeping bag. Now they have to start over, so now they're, they're back to ground one, a drawing board, right? Step one of where am I going to sleep, how am I going to stay warm, how am I going to, all the essential basics of life. Before they can even begin to think about anything else, those are the things they have to think about and figure out. Where's the nearest shelter? Is that shelter full? The, the lack of peace and the constant chaos leads to a lack of hope. And what we've seen, praise God, when we, when we move people into Agape Village, which we have seven people in Agape Village right now. When we move people into Agape Village, it takes time, but eventually folks begin to feel safe, and they begin to rest, and they begin to experience the God of peace. And that peace leads to hope. And hope always leads to transformation. So God, God does have something better but sometimes it's hard for us to see it if we first can't find any peace. Now, maybe you can't relate to that because you've never been in that situation, but I'm sure you've had similar experiences. In some way, you have found yourself, maybe it's an emotional turmoil, just emotionally hard time. Maybe you're physically exhausted. Maybe you're stuck in constant conflict with a family member. Maybe you too are experiencing pain from your own past that's manifesting itself in your life in different ways. And you don't see any, any way out because tomorrow always brings the same issues. Tomorrow always brings the same burdens and you feel hopeless. If you could 
if, if only you could find some way, right? Some way to take a breath. Some way to go and find some peace where everything's just been dampened down. The noise is gone, the pain is gone, the chaos is gone, and you can sit and take a breath, like when it snows. You need some peace to see clearly the hope that God has for you. If you could just see this, this supposed light that everybody's talking about that exists at the end of the tunnel, if you could find just a moment to look, a moment to focus, a moment of peace, then maybe, maybe you could see it. We, we've not only got to introduce people to the God of hope, We've, we've got to make sure that we ourselves are resting in his peace and, and inviting others to enter into that peace. So perhaps before we can come to a place of renewed hope, we first have to come to a place of peace. We need to find that calm in the midst of the storm, that quietness in our soul, so that we can see what God has for us. And that's exactly the picture that's exactly the picture that Isaiah paints for, for Judah when he's sharing with them his words in Isaiah chapter 11. Let me just read a portion of that passage again to you. Isaiah 11 verses 6 through 9. It says, In that day the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard, leopard, the leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear, the cub and the calf will lie down together, the lion will eat hay like a cow, the baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord." I love, I love that passage. I love the imagery that Isaiah is painting for Judah. But if I was to try and describe what he's seeing, it's peace. It's peace. It, supposed enemies hanging out with each other. Dangerous situations have gone. There's no fear. There's no anxiety. There's no worry. Children are leading the adults and people aren't panicked about that. People, kids are hanging out with cobras and nobody's scared to death about that. Like this is a scene of peace. The chaos is gone. It's a sense of calmness. It's snowing, right? It's snowing. These people are calm in the midst of all of this. And so when Jud Judah heard this, it gave, it gave them hope because it, it reminded them of a peace that was going to come. Something to look forward to, that this constant fighting and conflict, the bondage that you find yourself in, the anxiety that you constantly exist in will one day be over. And so just the idea of that peace gave them a sense of hope, and the same can go for us. We can find hope today because we have a peaceful future to look forward to. And this is definitely a message that's worth sharing, right? Come to Jesus and one day you'll get to look forward to living in peace. The constant pain and turmoil and brokenness and chaos, the emotional pain, the physical exhaustion, the, the arguing, the bickering, the disunity, all the things that, we've, that we are frustrated with and tired of in the gospel go away. That's part of the good news of Jesus is that in the future, we have total and complete peace. It's going to be totally calm. Everything's dampened. Everything's quiet. Everything is better. I love how Revelation paints the kingdom of God and describes it for us. It says in Revelation that God will wipe away every tear, that there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. It's peace. John in Revelation doesn't use the imagery of the lion laying with the lamb. He, he doesn't talk about kids playing with cobras and kids leading them, but it's still a picture of peace, right? We, we fear and we worry over death and pain in this life. We grieve and we mourn loss, and all of these things distract us from the hope that God has for us, from the peace that we can live in. But one day we get to look forward to the abolishment of all of that stuff, all of it being done away with, all of it being gone. No more pain, no more crying, no more fighting, no more enemies. We're finally at peace. 
We want that. We, we, we long for that kind of peace. We, we, want so, we so desperately want peace. People everywhere talking about peace. We often look for it in all the wrong places and we often go about trying to obtain it in all the wrong ways. It's, it's funny to me that a lot of times we go about pursuing peace in very selfish ways. My peace, if it infringes upon yours, doesn't really matter as long as I have it. Like we have a messed up picture sometimes of peace, but we, it's something we long for. It's something that we want. We want the pain to stop. We want pain in every form to go away, emotional pain, physical pain, we want everybody to be treated equal. We don't want, we, we want the fear and the anxiety that comes along with all kinds of things in this life to, to go away. We want to live and exist in peace without being tormented by constant worry or, or fear. We want to be free from all strife. We, we don't want to argue anymore, right? We, we don't want to be divided anymore. I, we, I mean, why can't everybody just get along, right? That's, what, that's, our, that's our cry. That's our plea. Why can't everybody just get along? We want this kind of peace. So, so when we live in this world and we read these words, we read them as a description of a future, of a hope that we have in the future. And that's great. We should. That's should because we're not, we don't find much peace here right now, right? So it's got to be a future hope. It's got to be something that we get to look forward to. And it is, it is, it is something that we get to look forward to. And I hope that in just, in just talking about the peace that we can have in the future, that we can get a glimpse of the hope that we can have today, that it will not always be this way. If you're stuck in a peaceless life without peace today, that's what I want you to hear right now. If I tell you you can have peace today, it might not mean a whole lot, but I'm telling you, you can have peace. Peace will come. It's not going to be like this forever. This is not the good that God created you for. This is not good, and God knows it, and God's going to bring about peace in your life. Trust him. Have faith in him. There is the lion and the lamb will lay together. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. There is hope in that. Hold on to that peace. Find that peace in your life. The pain, the fighting, the struggling. You find your life. It's not your, it's not your final destination. It's not the end. God has better. The, the best truly is yet to come. Truly is. Just hold on. Stick with him. And one day you'll see it. I promise you. Isaiah told that to Judah, one day you will see it. One day you will be set free. One day you will have peace. And that's the future part of this passage. But as I talked about last week, I want to remind you that I think this passage not only talks about the future, but I really do believe this passage also talks about the, the present. Because wouldn't it be great if, if we could talk about a future peace, that this isn't the end, that there's something better ahead. But wouldn't it also be great to be like, but we can have peace today in the midst of all of this? Wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to wait for eternity to live in peace, to experience God's peace? Wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, last week in our Zoom call, one of the folks on our Zoom call made an awesome uh, gave an awesome description about this passage, that it was peace in the midst of violence. Lions, lambs. Like they're, they're supposed to be going at each other, right? But it's in the midst of the storm. It's in the midst of the violence that Judah is saying, you can have peace. It's, in the, it's, it's right now that we can have peace. I believe one day we will live in this peace fully, perfectly, completely. But I think that right now, I believe that right now, we can start to enjoy that peace today. It may be imperfect. It might not be fully complete yet. In other words, we still may have violent things to go through. There still may, might be fighting and mourning. But the thing is, is that God in the midst of all of that can still give us peace. So if this is how God's eternal kingdom is going to be, why wait to start living in it? Let's start living in it right now. Let's not read this as just a future peace but let's also read into it as a present piece. Let's read Isaiah 11 and the book of Revelation as a paradigm for how we as the church should exist and interact with each other right here and right now, giving the world a glimpse of what it's going to look like in the future. I love how one of our general superintendents, Dr. Busick, puts it. He says, this description in Isaiah 11 
serves as a beautiful portrait of how God desires life to be shared among and through his people. It's this awesome picture. And the world is looking to the church for what we preach all this stuff, but what's it look like in life? Here's what it's supposed to look like in life. Right here, right now, we can tell the world through the peace that we exist in and live in what God's kingdom of peace is going to look like in the future. I mean, think about this. Think about this passage, and it's what Jesus taught. Think about what Jesus taught. He said in Matthew chapter 5, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. We're supposed to be peacemakers. He prayed in John 17 for us to exist in unity. He, he said that we're supposed to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. That we're supposed to love each other. When somebody's thirsty, give them a drink. When somebody's hungry, give them something to eat. If somebody's naked, we're supposed to give them some clothing. We're supposed to be there for one another. In the Sermon on the Mount, he talks over and over again about how we're supposed to go the extra mile, pray for our enemy, forgive those who have wronged us and harmed us. We're supposed to turn the other cheek and not return evil for evil. The entire Sermon on the Mount is about living in peace. He taught constantly and exhibited for us what living in peace today in the midst of an unpeaceful world could look like. We don't have to wait for a future peace. We can choose today to live in the peace of God. The church, the church, capital C church, the church, the body of Christ should be a place of peace right now. We should be a community that lives and exists in contrast to the rest of the world around us. Let me say that again. We should be a place, we should be a community that lives and exists in contrast to the world around us. We are supposed to be in the world, but not of it. We should be in it, but look different. And we can show the world another way. And if we, if we look like the rest of the world, though, then who's going to want to come join us? Who's going to want to be a part of this? What's the point of the gospel if we look like everyone else? But if we can learn to exist in peace, to take Jesus' teachings on peace seriously, and to take this picture of Isaiah seriously, to take the description and revelation of peace seriously, and begin to do our best to live in that today, we've given the gospel some teeth, some might, and some power. Because it's not just about a future that may or may not come, right? But it's about a present reality lived in peace that then just gives us affirmation that the future peace that the scriptures talk about, it's real and it's obtainable and it can happen. And that's where our hope gets renewed. And that's where our hope grows strong. I see in an Isaiah and I see throughout the teachings of Jesus and in Revelation that he's not just talking about peace, but he's actually inviting us to live in peace. He's inviting us to be a part of a community of peace. He's inviting us to bring peace into this world. That's what he's doing. So I want to read this passage and others like it as an invitation, as an invitation, as a challenge, a, a different way of doing life. Let me show you a different way, a new way, a better way, an invitation that looks like the kingdom of God is breaking in. And that's the beauty of the gospel, that we are invited to be partakers of this good news and all that comes along with it. We are invited to be partakers of the peace of God. And as we partake of God's peace, we can live in God's peace. And as we partake of his peace and as we live in his peace, we get to extend peace into the community and the world around us. We get to be uh, the infusers of peace, if I can put it that way, infusing peace into our community and into the situations where there isn't any so that people can see the truth of the gospel. Jeremiah 29, 7, he says, Let's work for the peace and prosperity of the city. Sounds good, right? Great. But look what else he says. You're supposed to work for the peace and prosperity of the very city to where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its peace will determine your peace. And Jeremiah, he's talking to people that have gone into exile, that have been taken bondage by people that destroyed their homes. And he says, now that you're in this city, you need to live your life. 
get married, have the kids, build a home, live in it, work there, be there, be a part of that city where you've been forced to live, where you've been sent into exile, be there and pray for the peace and work for the peace of the city. Because if that city's in peace, you get to be in peace. What an awesome challenge. See, this idea of peace, it's an invitation for us to be a part of something amazing. It's an invitation for us to be a part of something right here and right now today. Work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into ex ex exile. See, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't even matter why you're where you are right now. It doesn't matter why you're there. You are to seek peace. And that to me is a challenge that we need to seek peace and work for peace all the time in every situation. We should never not seek the peace of God. We are expected to live in it and seek it for all the people around us, even the city. That's the church, folks. That's us. This is us. We might feel like we're in a foreign land at times and we might feel like we've been exiled into this strange and foreign place where nobody wants to hear anything that we have to say. So let's stop trying to preach it and let's start living it. Let's live in this peace. How, how though, right? How in the world are we supposed to do that when I don't feel very peaceful? How, do, how am I supposed to go seeking the peace of the city when I don't feel like I'm at peace? How do we go about doing it? How do I live and work for peace in a place that I don't like, in a time that I'm not content in. When I feel angst and anxiety, how am I supposed to be the peace to the people around us? Man, I get it. I get it. I need them to change before I can be at peace, right? That's, that's kind of how our culture operates. That's kind of how we've been trained to think. But, but the way of Christ is different than that. Look what Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 27. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. He is our how. Jesus is our how. He is our way to peace. This peace that I'm talking about today, this peace that Isaiah talks about, that Revelation talks about, the peace that we're invited to be a part of, it's not a peace that you and I have to conjure up. It's not a peace that you and I have to, to pull out of thin air. It's not a peace that you and I even have to feel like giving. It's a peace that Jesus himself gives us. It's his peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. This peace is a gift of God. This peace comes directly from him. It's his peace. Jesus has given us peace. So there's no excuses for us to not live in peace today because it's not a peace that depends on me. It's not a peace that depends on you. It's a peace that depends on Jesus. And Jesus is always dependable. And Jesus always comes through. And Jesus is always there. So when Jesus says to us, I have given you my peace, we better trust that. And we better believe that. And we better live in that reality. And Jesus puts it back on us. I've given you my peace. So don't you let your heart be troubled. Don't you let it be fearful. If you're being fearful and afraid, man, that, that is on us. Let's choose today to not be that. Let's choose instead to live in the peace, to accept the peace that Jesus himself has given us. Let's make a different choice. We have more control than we think we do in the way we go about living our life. Choose peace. He gives us that option and he's giving us his peace. Choose it. Peace is not something that you have to wait an eternity for, praise God. Peace is something you can have today and Jesus is offering you his peace. How awesome. I mean, think about the peace that Jesus had, how he was able to go and, and endure some of the most violent things, more violent than we'll ever experience, the persecution, the beatings that he took, nails through his hands onto a cross, and the peace that he displayed in the midst of all of that to the point of convincing Roman soldiers, this guy was no criminal, he is the son of God. This is the peace that Jesus displayed. This is the peace that got people's attention as he stood silent before his accusers. Jesus displayed this peace, and it's that peace that God wants to give us. He's giving it to you. Take it 
and live in that peace. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's an invitation to peace. Isn't, isn't ultimately that what, that's what we want when we talk about peace, right? Isn't it rest? Isn't it rest? When I talk about how quiet it is when it snows, it's like you can just stop for a minute. You can let your mind rest. And peace comes in. And it's quiet. And it's calm. And it's like, you know what? I can smile today. Things are going to be all right. I have hope because I have peace. I have peace because I have hope. Jesus is offering us something beautiful, something amazing. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This peace that Jesus is inviting us into, it's not just a it's not just an individual thing. It's not just a personal state of, of my well-being or your well-being. It's more than that. Jesus wants you to be peaceful. Jesus wants me to be at peace. Jesus wants you to rest. Jesus wants me to rest. But it's not just an individual thing. See, this peace that Jesus talks about, this peace that Isaiah talks about, the peace that John talks about in Revelation, it's not just an individual thing, but it's also a corporate thing. It describes a community, a community of people at peace. It captures this idea of peace, of shalom in Scripture. It captures this idea of an entire society at peace, the well-being of an entire society. Jeremiah, fight for the peace of your city. Fight for the peace of your city. I believe before we can fight for the peace of our city, we've got to experience the peace of God for ourselves personally. And that's my invitation to you today. We're living in a time of chaos and pain and brokenness, and some of you are experiencing tremendous, tremendous burdens. And all I have to say to you today is, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's enter into the peace of God. Let's accept the peace that Jesus is giving us today so that then we can strive to be a community of peace so that then we can, we can fight for the peace of our families, fight for the peace of our neighborhoods, fight for the peace of our city. And then we can sit back and watch just how amazing how amazing it is when people get a taste of what God has for them. So, man, are you watching today? Are you listening today? And are you searching for peace? Are you going, man, I would love, I would love to have that. It's yours. Jesus is willing to give it to you. Jesus has already given it to you. Just pick it up and live in it. Choose peace today. Maybe you're tired you're, you're weary, you're heavy laden, the burdens are too much. Come to him. He's asking for your burdens. He wants to give you rest. And he wants to give it to you now. We'll enjoy it to complete perfection in the future, but we get to enjoy a taste of it today. And a taste, a taste of God's presence and of God's peace is enough to transform your life for eternity. So take and live in God's peace today. May we all enter into his rest. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for the peace that you have given us. Help us, God, today to, to live in that peace. Help us, Lord, as a church to be a church, a community of peace that lives in stark contrast to the world around us, that lives and is an example, a living, breathing example of the gospel of Christ, of what peace looks like, of what your kingdom living looks like, showing the world there's a different way to live, a better way. God, I pray right now specifically for those who are carrying heavy burdens, for those, God, who are in desperate search, search for peace, for those, who God, who desperately need your rest. I pray right now you lift their burdens. Right now you fill them with a peace that surpasses all understanding. Right now, Lord God, that you would bring comfort where there needs to be comfort. God, that you would just simply give rest. 
in the midst of the trials, the grieving, and the storm, that your peace and your presence would be louder and bigger than anything else. God, we thank you for the peace that you've given us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.